the most meaningful object you own? I'll give you a moment to think about it. Okay, got it. Good. Maybe it's an expensive piece of jewelry passed down to you by a relative. Maybe it's a book you read as a child. Or maybe it's a piece of furniture with a long history of shared experiences in your family. I'd be willing to bet, though, that whatever that object is, is something that makes you think of the person who owned it before you did. I'd also bet that when you hold that object in your hand, you imagine the life that person led. It's like that object has a sort of magical power, a power to take you directly to that person, dead or alive. For me, my object, it's a jello mold. I know that sounds ridiculous, but it's true. The jello mold has the power to take me to my grandmother's kitchen, where she cooked three meals a day for her children and husband for over 50 years. Doris Terrebonne Laborde grew up in Cutoff, Louisiana, speaking only French. When she first attended school, she was spanked for not speaking English. Her mother died when she was 14 years old, and six months later, she moved to New Orleans to ben begin cosmetology school. It was there that she met and married my grandfather at age 16. She raised three girls in a house with no indoor plumbing, where she bathed them in a metal tub in front of a wood-burning stove. She loved to cook, and I loved her dearly. Every time I use her jello mold, I think of the sorrow and happiness of her life. This type of magical thinking is not new. Take the story of Ashley Sack, written about by Harvard history professor, Dr. Taya Miles. Found by a thrift shopper in a pile of scrap fabric at a flea market in the early 2000s and then rescued by a museum, this Civil War era sackcloth bag belonged to a young enslaved girl named Ashley. When her mother Rose learned that her daughter was to be sold, Rose gave her daughter this survival bag to take with her. Years later, Ashley's daughter Ruth embroidered a short version of the story on the sack. My great-grandmother Rose, mother of Ashley, gave her this sack when she was sold at age nine in South Carolina. It held a tattered dress, three handfuls of pecans, a braid of Rose's hair, told her, it be filled with my love always. She never saw her again. Ashley is my grandmother. Ruth Middleton, 1921. Is there anyone, after hearing this story, who is not taken immediately in our minds to the life of little Ashley, to the moment when her mother handed her the bag? How hard it must have been to leave her mother. How much her mother must have cried as she carefully chose items to place in the sack for her daughter. This is the power of an object, to give us a view into the life of its owner in a very tangible way. As a teacher of the ancient world, I too use the power of objects to teach about the people who use them. In the field of classics and archaeology, we call these objects material culture. In my Roman technology class, students reproduce the products and processes of ancient daily life through experimental archaeology. We try to build things the ancient Romans did in the same way and with the same tools they used to do it to give us insight into their lives. This material culture can be instructive. Since most of what we know about ancient people is from literature, our view of them is limited. Ancient Greek and Roman people that had the time and resources to write were mostly male and upper class. Subsequently, we know a lot about people like Julius Caesar, we don't know much about the lives of children, the enslaved, skilled craftspeople, and women. The lives of these people can be a mystery, and thus our understanding of the ancient past is incomplete. Through this process of using material culture to learn about the past, my students gain, gain a deeper understanding of what ancient daily life was like, and sometimes it was hard. One of my Roman technology class projects is making mosaics. Before the artistic process of making pictures out of stone begins, ancient craftspeople had to cut small pieces of stone called tesserae from different colors of marble. 
Looking at this picture of a mosaic, you can probably tell that you needed a lot of tesserae to do this. My students learned to cut stone the ancient Roman way using mosaic hammers and metal wedges, and they love to cut stone. But at one point during a long stone cutting session, I looked up from what I was doing and realized that the whole room was filled with dust from the tiny particles of stone we had been cutting. Probably not the safest environment for long periods of time, I thought to myself. And then it hit me. Ancient stone cutters must have been very sick. And suddenly, the hammer in my hand felt different. I was taken back to an ancient stone cutting workshop to see what life was like for the people there. Objects have the power to do that, to transport us and to instruct us. One of my favorite lessons to teach is weaving. In the ancient world of many different cultures, and even today, people tell stories through the cloth they weave. Because very little cloth exists from the ancient Mediterranean, my students read about famous weavers such as Arachne, the victim of Athena, and Penelope, the life of Odysseus. After learning about the mechanics of weaving, students weave their own simple mini tapestries. They sit around my classroom and with their friends, telling stories, learning to tell their own stories through the objects they create. Those who keep their creations may look back many years from now and remember how they made them, the friends they were with, and the teacher who taught them. Objects are magical in that way. As teachers, we have the power to bring the unheard voices of history to life through the everyday objects people owned and used. We gain a much deeper appreciation for those unheard voices through objects. Material culture can be magical, and I hope you'll consider using some magic in your classes sometime soon.